السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين When we read the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We have to remind ourselves of many things before actually reading it Two of the things that we have to remind ourselves of is that the Quran is a message to each and every single one of us. We can't read it as a book that was given just to the Prophet ﷺ, or as a book that was intended just for the people of Quraysh at that time, or as a book just for the people of his generation ﷺ. It is a book for every single generation, and it is a book for every single person. So when we open the Quran, we're not just reading a book of history, we're reading a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed at each and every one of us. When we look at the Quran in that way, we'll be able to relate the ayahs to our lives. It's no longer theoretical, it's now something that's applicable to every single one of our lives. And even the ayahs that talk about Fir'aun, or Abu Lahab, or the Kuffar of Quraysh, or the munafiqeen, we should be able to relate every single ayah to our lives. So when we read the ayahs of Abu, of about Abu Lahab and how he had spite for the Prophet ﷺ, we have to do a lot of introspection and look at our lives and make sure we don't have any aspects of Abu Lahab in our lives. When we read about Fir'aun in the Qur'an, we have to make sure that we don't have any aspects of Fir'aun in our lives. Males or females, brothers or sisters, whether you're a husband with your wife or a wife with her husband, we cannot have any aspects of Fir'aun in his oppression of other people. So when we do this, these two things, when we recognize that the, the Qur'an is directed at each and every one of us and we're able to see that the Qur'an isn't just taken literally for that sebab of nuzul, we, we understand that there are reasons why ayahs and surahs were revealed. Those are called Asbab al nuzul And to truly understand the Qur'an, you have to understand the Asbab al nuzul the reasons for revelation. So we realize that Abu Lahab cursed the Prophet ﷺ and said, Tabban lak, curse to you. Or literally it means you're a loser. You're a loser, Tabban lak. And so immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded, Tabbat yada abi lahabim wa tab. No, the loser is the actions of Abu Lahab And the surah goes on So we will realize why the surah was revealed But we have to understand the underlying meanings of that surah And this goes for every ayah in the Quran So I wanted to take one ayah And allow us to analyze it And see how it applies to our um, lives And this is an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Describes the believers He gives the descriptions of who exactly are the believers What do they do? And he says in Surah Al-Insan وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا And that the believer gives food out of love And I'll explain the two understandings of what this love is Out of love to who? To the miskeen, the poor person The yatim, the orphan, and the prisoner So there's two things here The love, why are we doing it? The it'am, the feeding and who are we feeding? So let's take the first one. The first one is They give food for, his, for the love. It just says for the love. The scholars have two interpretations of this. One, it's for the love of the food. Like the food that we love, that's what we give out. Not the food that we, we're ready to discard and we're just going to give a donation when we're really just trying to get rid of our garbage. And that's what happens sometimes. When they do food drives, people will clear out their old, the expired cans. When it's ready for, you know, when you're totally done with your clothes and you don't want to wear it anymore or it doesn't fit, oh, that's what I'll donate. But we know that that's the characteristics of the munafiqeen. They would look at the, the worst of their wealth and then give that out. And in the story of Cain and Abel, Qabil wa Habil, Qabil, when it came time for each of them to make a sacrifice, Qabil, who was a, who was a farmer, he took the worst of his crop and put it on the altar. And in those days, if a person made a sacrifice, it would be immediately accepted or rejected. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send a fire from the heavens and it would, if it consumed the, the offering, the charity, the sadaqah, you would know immediately whether or not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted that. So Qabil put forth his, the worst of his crop because he wasn't going to listen to the command of Allah anyway. He wanted to marry his, uh, uh, the person that he wanted to marry. And without going into the, the details of that story, the point is that Qabil gave the worst of his wealth. It was not accepted. Habil on the other hand, gave the best of his wealth. He was a shepherd, and he picked the best of his flock to give out. The munafiqeen, they used to give out the worst of their, of, their, of their wealth. So the sign of a person giving sincerely for the sake of Allah is that they take the things that they love. So that's one interpretation, that we give, when we give, we give the things that we love, not the things that we don't care about, because the real test is in giving the things that we love. The other interpretation of he of the dhamir of ha of the, the, the pronoun of ha ala hubbihi is that it's out of love of Allah because there's a lot of people that give and they may give the wealth that they love but why are they giving it why are we giving it we have to ask ourselves are we giving this for the sake of Allah for the sake of God for the sake of God or are we giving it so that people will say he's generous so we have to do that introspection into our lives and see when we give is it that we're giving for the sake of God or for the sake of so that we just get a good feeling or that people say something about us or they can see us giving, uh, giving the wealth? So that's one aspect, the, the hub, the love that's mentioned in that ayah. The second is it'am. Allah says, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَام That he, they give food. Now going back to the, the concept that I was mentioning about we cannot take the ayah just as it was as it was revealed, we have to kind of scrape the surface and look at the underlying meaning. So in this, when if it's an ayah revealed about Fir'aun, it might be talking to us. If it's about the munafiqeen, it's not just to the munafiqeen. So if Allah is saying they give food, does that mean that it's just food? The mufassirun say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used food as an example of doing goodness to others. Because everybody recognized one of the, the, the immediate benefit that anybody needs is food. If you don't have food, there's going to be no education, no social structure, no building of the family. You have to have food, the basic essential of survival. So Allah is just using that because every human being, even if you cannot communicate with them, you don't know their, their, their language, if you give them food, that's a, it's a universal language. You've done something good for them, and they recognize that good. So because it's a universally recognized uh, token of goodness or show of goodness, Allah used it, but it doesn't mean that it's just food, it's other things. So we cannot, be just, uh, we cannot be in a state where we're just giving out food. We have to give out anything that benefits. Any benefit that a person needs, that's what we're giving out. So a person, may his stomach may be full, but we have to see, is there any other benefit that he or she needs? And then we give out those things. So that could be, um, that could be in helping them get a job. It could be in helping them get married. It could be in helping them uh, through a family uh, dispute. It could be help giving them time. It could be helping them in giving them employment or teaching them a job. Any type of benefit that you could give to another person, that's a sadaqah. That's a charity. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that every day that the sun rises, we should be given charity. But then some people might think, well, I don't have any wealth. I can't buy food to give it out or I can't buy money. But if we're thinking of charity just as wealth that we give out, then we, we have to reassess our understanding of charity. Charity is giving out anything of benefit to another person. And for that reason, the Prophet ﷺ said that even a smile is charity. Even smiling to your brothers. And everybody knows that when you're having a bad day and you meet somebody, whether it's in your family or a friend, and they just look at you and they embrace you with a, uh, a, a, a warm hug and they give you a, a, just a warm embrace and a smile, it, it uplift, uplifts your spirit. And that smile could be more beneficial to you at that time than a plate of food. So you might say, I'm full, I'm satiated, I don't need any food, but I just need somebody to talk to. And I remember I learned this lesson from my, from my mother one day when I was in um, high school and I had, a, I had a job at the mall and at that time I wasn't driving, so she picked me up and she knew somebody at the place where, where I worked. It was a, a Muslim sister. And so my mom spent about an hour and a half talking to her. And so I was in the car 
waiting, and you know how teenagers will be like if their parents are late or they got a meeting, so I was getting frustrated. And so when my mother came back into the car, I said, you know, it's, it, why'd you take so long? It wasn't, I wasn't having proper edda, it's not proper to, to re- address a parent in that way. But I asked her, I said, why, you know, why'd you spend an hour and a half just talking to her? And so she told me, she said, you know, Rami, sometimes people need somebody to talk to. She was going through a lot of issues in her life, uh, family issues and financial issues and so forth, and they just need somebody to talk to. That's all. They just want a shoulder to cry on. And so by you giving your time, you're giving sadaqah, because time is money. That's not just a cliche. You can break down how much your dollar is worth. Whether you're the richest person on the face of the earth, where they can tell you how many tens of thousands of dollars their seconds are, or whether you're just walking the streets back and forth to work, you're, each hour you could be spending it uh, uh, doing something to where you're getting money for it. Or you could be doing your ibadah. The point is that's your time. That's a blessing that Allah has given you, has given us. And Allah will ask us about our time and how we use it. So if we use it for somebody else, that's a sadaqah, that's a charity. So giving out your time is, is, also a, um, is also a form of charity. And wallahi, there was a person who became Muslim just because of that, just because of giving its time. And we lived in an apartment complex, and he was the maintenance, ma- maintenance manager. Um, rahmatullahi alayhi, he passed away. But every day I would pass by and say, hey, Tyrone, how are you doing? And he would just start talking. And sometimes he'd talk for half an hour, sometimes for 45 minutes. And I'll just, you know, he's just unloading his problems. This is my family problems. This is my uh, uh, job problems, whatever it is, my car, this, that, or the other. And so um, after a couple months, he said, you know, Rami, I really like talking to you. And I didn't want to tell him, well, we're not really talking. I'm just listening to you. (laughs) But the point is that he he built up a strong relationship with me just because I gave him the time to, um, uh, to... to listen, and it was, I gave him a CD, The Life of the Last Prophet by Yusuf Islam, and um, I gave it to him to listen to it because it gives a, a really nice overview of the seerah in just about an hour. And so I used to ask him, I said, are you listening to the CD? He's like, well, I haven't started it yet, haven't started it with a cassette tape, well, I haven't started. I finally figured out that he wasn't starting because at the beginning there's a band, so he's like, oh, Rami gave me a tape in Arabic, I can't understand it. So he, it took him a while to realize that the Arabic was just for about a minute of the tape, and then the rest of it's in English. So then I asked him one day, I said, where'd you get on the tape? He said, I'm at the, I'm at the prophet convention. I'm at the point where it's the prophet convention. And I was thinking, what's the prophet convention? And I recognized it's the story of Isra wal Mi'raj, where the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went from Mecca to uh, Jerusalem, and there he prayed with the prophets, and so uh, the brother described it as uh, the prophet convention. So. But alhamdulillah, he became, he became Muslim and he passed away a few years ago, rahmatullahi alayhi. But that all started because of just a little bit of sadaqah. Just a little bit of sadaqah. And Allah recognizes the power of sadaqah and, um, and his infinite uh, knowledge. And he put in one of the recipients of zakah is the people that are close to Islam. Either newly Muslims or interested in Islam. Just so, because... If you, if you do good to people and you help them out financially, they're going to have a good opinion of you and be able to see the truth of the message and not, be, uh, uh, not have their vision blurred by what the, 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 the critics say about Islam. So we have to give all types of benefit, whether it's knowledge, whether it's our time, whether it's ch- charity, phys- like money or food. Now who do we give it to? Who do we give the sadaqah to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the miskeen, the poor person, and the yatim, and the orphan, and the prisoner. So when we look at these categories, we can't look at it just like, okay, you're a poor person. What do the books of fiqh define as a poor person? Okay, somebody that doesn't have enough food for one day. Well, you got food for two days, so you're not included in the ayah. We can't look at it like that because Allah is teaching us a principle. We can't get caught up in the exactness of that ayah. In some of the ayahs, the ayahs that talk about ahkam, the ayahs that have a specific legal ruling, you take it as it is. You, there's no interpretation there. Uh, but if it's an ayah that's talking about motivation to do good, then we can't say, well, Allah said the miskeen, he's not a miskeen, I can, I'm not going to benefit him. Or the next one is the orphan. Okay, what defines a person as an orphan? Technically, the Prophet ﷺ said the definition of an orphan in the sharia, in the sacred law, 
is a, uh, a boy or a girl who has not reached the, the age of adulthood and they've lost their father, their father specifically. That's a yatim in the Arabic language. But we know that if a person loses their mother, they've also lost a huge part of their life. So we have to treat them as an orphan. Or what about if a person is, maybe he's reached the age of adulthood, he's lost one or two of his parents, so technically he's not a yatim, so some of the, the aspects of the sharia that apply specifically to yatims, it doesn't apply to them, but we're going to treat him as, a, as, a, as an orphan. Or what if a person has both of their parents, but, bo but neither of their parents or, bo uh, or one of their parents didn't give them what a parent usually gives their child by nature? And so he was raised with his parents, but sometimes the parent was actually more of a detriment to his de development than somebody that didn't even have a parent. And so, in, in a way, they're an orphan. So we should treat them as an orphan in, that, in, in benefiting them. Look at them as an orphan. Or if a person comes new to a community, he might have his mother and father, and they might have given him a good upbringing, but now he, come, he or she comes to a new community, and now they don't have anybody around them. And so in a way, they're an orphan. So we have to look at them in that, in that way and treat them, treat them as such. Or if a person comes new to Islam, in a way, they've left a lot of things behind them. And so they need a community to embrace them as, a, as, a, as an orphan, in the sense that they've, left, they've lost a lot of things, just like that orphan who has, left his, uh, has lost his parents. The third category that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in that ayah is the asir, the prisoner. Now this is a very powerful lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us and all of the lessons in the Qur'an are powerful. But he says asir. In the Mufassirun, they explain exactly who is Allah referring to in that ayah. Who is the prisoner that Allah is referring to? The prisoner that Allah is referring to and commanding us as believers to feed them and not just in food but in any type of benefit that we can give to them. Those are the prisoners that were taken as prisoners of war. In the early days of Islam, when the non-Muslims were, were attacking the Muslims and there were engagements in battle, there were battles, the battle of Badr, the battle of Uhud, there were prisoners of war taking on both sides. And so the Muslims did take some of the, the idol worshippers as prisoners during that war, and so Allah revealed to the believers, saying, take care of those prisoners. And saying that a, a sign of the believers is that they give, bring benefit to those prisoners. Remember, these are the idol worshippers that were out to harm the Muslim community. They wanted to kill people amongst the Muslims. But when, the, when, that, when the battle was over and their weapons were taken away, Allah reminds us of the humanity and says, feed that person. Take care of that person and bring benefit to that person. So this is powerful because Allah is telling us to get away from our emotions and to not do things in an emotional way. We, many of us are familiar with the story of Ali عنه, when he was in a battle and his opponent spat on him. And so Ali threw his sword down and walked away. And then the person said, why'd you do that? He said, he said because, and then he came back, he picked up the sword and then he continued the battle. And then he, 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 um, uh, he conquered him, but then the, the per he didn't kill him. The person asked him, he said, why'd you do that? Why'd you stop the, the battle uh, or the, um, uh, the, the duel that we were having. He said, because I was, I was engaged in a battle with you and I was doing this for the sake of God. Allah has ordered us to protect the believers and when I was protecting you as an enemy, he didn't say this, but this is the, the understanding, I was protecting the safety of the community by, by engaging in battle in you. When you spat on me, I became angry at you and it became personal. And so I knew I could not, I could not continue this because now it's personal. And we, know, we all know once things become personal, once it becomes emotional, you lose logic. You lose your logic, and your emotions take over, and your emotions drive you. But if you look at Ali radiallahu anhu, it wasn't his emotions that were driving him. It was the, 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 the deen, and doing the, th uh, the things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah tells us to feed these people that have just attacked you, and now they're under your control, feed them, take care of them. It's a reminder to us that we have to benefit people even if they're our enemies, even if they were out to harm us, and even if they're still in the process of harming us. If there's somebody from some of the media uh, uh, stations that have a negative uh, view of Islam and spread lies about Islam, and yet that person is walking along the street and get hit by a car, are we not gonna go and help them out? Help them out? 
if we allow our emotions to take over and say, hey, you, you deserve what you got, and just go ahead and wait for the ambulance, and maybe by that time, it's too late. Or are we going to look at things without emotion and go to that person and give him benefits because he's a human being and he deserves that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to benefit uh, those people. So these are the three aspects. The love of the things that we're giving out, and what exactly is it that we're giving out, <coughs> and who is it that we're, we're giving it to. Now the Mufassirun say about the Asir, as an end to that, to that ayah, they say if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to bring benefits and help the non-Muslim prisoner who was taken as a prisoner of war after attacking the Muslim, then what about your, what about your Muslim brother who was taken as a prisoner? What type of help should we be giving them? And what importance should we be doing to help them? So now there's some conditions to, to, helping, to helping others. One of the conditions is that we have to start with ourselves. We can't help other people until we've helped ourselves. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us and teaches us in the Quran by saying, Qul anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and your families from the fire. Before we go and we help other people, help other people bring them benefit, or bring them spiritual benefit, or any type of benefit, we have to help ourselves. We have to make sure that we are settled. Sp settled spiritually, and settled financially, settled in our identity, and then we can move on to helping other people. The ayah also says our family. We have to help our families. There are some people that get so caught up in helping other people that they forget who's at home. And there's an English saying, the, the cobbler's son has no shoes. And there's a colloquial saying in Jordan, uh, Ibn Skafi Hafi, meaning the same thing. And in, in all cultures in Mauritania, they say the blacksmith's door has no hinges. Basically, the idea is there's people that have benefit to give to others. And they're so caught up in benefiting others, they forget themselves and they forget their families. So when we go out into the world, into our communities, to help people, we have to make sure that our, we're helping ourselves first and foremost, and we're helping our families. And that's something that's uh, it's, it's across all societies. And it's across all Muslim communities where you find people that sometimes they're not able to maintain that balance of serving the community and serving their families. And it's a very difficult balance to maintain, but we have to keep reminding ourselves. And don't think that just because we give all this uh, service to the community at large, that it's automatically going to help our family. Because there's people, and a lot of people may know stories of people that are out in the community helping other people, and then their children just need their father or their mother, or their older brother or their sister. And then they go, they go astray, and then the person wakes up from all of this good community work they're doing, they turn around and they see, oh my God, what has happened to my son? Or what has happened to my daughter? But that was because they were benefiting others while forgetting themselves. So that's a condition of benefiting, that you have to benefit yourself and your family first and foremost. The Prophet وسلم, as it's mentioned in the Shama'il, when he would go home, he would split his time into three, three categories. Uh, one third for his, for his family, one third for himself, and then one third for ibadah. So taking, taking care of personal matters, sewing clothes, helping his family out, and also um, taking time for ibadah. So when we're, when we're looking at ourselves and trying to maintain that balance, we have to make sure that we're giving ourselves time for ibadah, time for worship, in addition to what we're doing outside. So when we go home, we have to be serving, uh, benefiting ourselves, benefiting our families, and also taking time to worship. One of the things that we learn from the Sunnah is the Prophet ﷺ was a master of time management. And every second was, had a specific purpose. And a good book to read is a book by uh, Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda. It says, it's called Qimatul Zaman Indul al Ulama, the value of time amongst the scholars. And it's been translated and it's available in English. But it just gives a lot of stories of how the scholars would really take their time seriously. And they wouldn't let it go. It's just like if somebody gave you a million dollars, you'd make sure to take care of that. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a certain lifespan, and we have to make sure that we're taking care of that. 
And the last thing that I'll leave with about this discussion about benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has a surah called Surah An-Nahl, the <coughs> excuse me, the chapter of the bee. And Allah doesn't just mention animals in the Quran for no for, for no reason. There's a specific reason for why he's mentioning things, for why he mentions stories, for why he mentions certain people, or why he mentions certain animals. And so if we we if he mentions one, whether it's the hudhud or the, the camel or the cow or the, the ant or the bee, we have to look at that and try to understand some of the wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us. So in the bee is a very beautiful example for us of benefiting others. The bee goes out and it goes to every mountain, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. It goes to all of the different mountains, taking from this pollen, taking from this nectar, taking from over here, then it goes home and then it produces a substance which is a healing for mankind, the honey. The honey gives itself benefit, so the bee is, is eating the honey, it's benefiting itself, then it's producing something that benefits others. And so that's a, an example of how we should be. We should be just like the bee goes out and collects from all of these different sources and then comes home, synthesizes that, and then produces something to benefit humanity. And the bee has a, has a many, we don't have much time to go into uh, the, the beauties of the bee, but just study more about the bee and see how, it can, how you can apply lessons from the bee into our lives. Some of the, 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 the lessons, bees are attracted to good smell. So if you're around bees and you have cologne or perfume or something, a bee will be attracted to that. Flies aren't attracted to good smells. And flies are, it, they have a lot of negative qualities. So we want to look at how the fly is, look at how the bee is, and, and see and, and try to emulate the, the good qualities that the bee has. Flies are attracted to foul things. If there's foul odors, the flies will come from all corners of the area to, to land on the, on the foul odors. And there are people that are like that. There are people that are attracted to foul things, foul and evil things. And yet the bee is attracted to good smells. And it goes to these good smells and it produces something very good. The fly goes to very foul things and it produces something disgusting. So we have to be like the bee and going to all of these good things and producing something good. And the bee can even go to things that are harmful, whether it's a, a, a bush that has uh, flowers but it has a lot of thorns or poison ivy. Um, there was um, a brother who brought us some or told us about some honey that he had that was poison ivy honey. It was bees that were taken from the, the, the flowers of poison ivy and it produced a very good honey. And so the bee was able to go to this thing that normally causes harm and yet finds the little benefit that you could take out of it or goes to that thorn bush and takes the little benefit. So that's how we should be. We don't discount anything. We don't discount it totally. We go to there, we say, okay, this is bad and this is good. Let's draw from the benefit, go back to my house, synthesize it and see how I can benefit myself with it and then benefit other people with it. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people that benefit themselves and benefit others. <coughs> And I'll begin the, the, the Arabic portion of the khutbah. In Alhamdulillah, in Ahmadu, who wants to ain who wants to fear who wants to do the Billahi in Shururi and Fusina, who means say ye at your Amalina, may ye deal love for them, Mudilla, whom you deal for her dealer, where I shed one la ilaha illa law, where Dahula Sharikala, where I shed one Mohammed and Abdu who are a Suru, Ya Ayuha Ladina Amu Tapullah, Hakutu Kati, he will atamu to Naila and to Muslimun. يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد إن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدى هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار
Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ya ibadullah, inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan, wa ita'i zil qurba, wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkari wal baghi, ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon. Udhkuru Allah la yadhkurukum, wa shkuruhu yazid lakum, wa staghfiruhu yaghfir lakum, wa attaquuhu yaj'al lakum min amrikum makhrija, wa aqimis salah.